So this is the user testing crash course. I'm Jeremy Kriegel. I'm the uh, UX director at a company called Omnisfell. We do pharmacy robotics, uh, which is like automating medicine, dispensing, inventory management, et cetera. So um, I saw a keynote a number of years ago, wonderful writer, Kathy Sierra, asked the audience a question. She asked, which would you rather have people saying? How great your company is or how great your product is? And so some people raise their hand for companies, some people raise their hand for product. And of course, anytime someone asks you a question with only two options, it's probably a trick question. The answer is always C. The answer is how great they are because of your product or service, right? So there's things that you use that are frustrating. You hate them, but you have to use them to get your work done or try to accomplish something. And your customers are the same, right? They want you to succeed. In fact, they need you to succeed so they can be awesome. Kathy Sierra also has this wonderful graphic she calls the kick-ass curve, right? If we look at ability on the left and time on the bottom, you know, ability has, uh, she puts these two thresholds. There's the suck threshold. And that's when your ability is, is uh, low, you're still learning and you're, and you're, and it, and it kind of feels like I'm no, I'm no good at this and I'm terrible and it feels bad, right? I'm not very effective. And then at that higher level, there's kind of that passion threshold or when you get into flow, like where you're really good at something, you're effective, you feel great and you lose track of time. That's, you know, you're thinking I rock, I'm awesome. So the faster you get people over the suck threshold and into the flow, the more likely you are, one, to really be serving people's needs and to create loyal, dedicated customers. How do you do that? We've got to talk to them and understand how effectively they're using your product or what problems they're having that you could be solving. And as obvious as that is, and I'm sure most of you are thinking like when I said that, like, well, duh, of course, we know we have to talk to people. My experience has been is that there's a huge reluctance to actually get out there and engage with the people we're trying to serve. Uh, I've seen this in many, many different companies over and over again. And, and I get it, right? Talking to people can be daunting. We're really busy with other things. And if we find out things that, you know, where we're wrong, we might have to do rework and we're on a calendar and it's, this is outside of our comfort zone, all kinds of reasons. But if you have a plan and and you can be a little more comfortable and you kind of have some more confidence in how to navigate things, I find it can be a little bit easier. So I'm going to talk about just a couple things to get started, and then we're going to dig into the 13 tips to make it far more effective. So the first and most important thing is you have to have a focus. Like, why are we doing this? What do we hope to achieve? What are we trying to learn? What assumption are we trying to test, right? So a couple of questions you can ask are, where are we foggy? And uh, that's FOG for facts, opinions, and guesses. What do we think we know to be true that we need to validate? Um, those are our facts. Uh, what, what are we sure? We're kind of sure. We think that's true. And again, we might want to validate it. And where are we just guessing? That's probably where there's a lot more risk. What are our known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns? Again, the things we think to be true that we might want to validate. The things we know we don't know that we need to investigate. And then there's the things that we haven't even thought of. We don't even realize we don't know. And for me, what I found, what I, and I think is interesting, is that the known knowns and the known unknowns seem to be kind of shared across the industry. You know, everyone kind of knows the same things because people move around, you read the same reports, yada, yada. And we kind of also know what we don't know. So the unknown unknowns, that's kind of the interesting part. That's where a lot of the insights that lead to innovation come from. And kind of finally, one of the last questions that I like asking is kind of like, where, if we're wrong, we are, we're in trouble. Let's just put it that way. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you're really clear on your focus. What are you trying to learn? What assumption are you trying to test? What do you want to get out of talking to people? You need to have some guide uh, so you can make the session productive. So that's your why. And then, okay, who do you need to talk to to learn that? And, and the thing to remember is you are not your customer. Even if you were at one time, once you have joined a product team, once you've joined a company and you're making products for even someone like you, unless you are making products for other like product owners, designers, whatever your role is, you're no longer your customer. I'll give you a great example. Um, a number of years ago, I worked at a startup that was serving physicians and it was founded by a former surgeon. Now that gentleman knew far more about what it was like in the day-to-day -day life of a physician than I will ever know. But at that point in his career, every day he spent as a CEO, he was becoming further and further removed from the day-to-day -day life of a doctor seeing patients. And so again, even if we were in that role before, we're not now, now we're product people. So we really want to try and get as close as we can to the people we're trying to serve. So let's, you know, who are those people? And one simple way is we can 
let's try and define their graphics, demographics, psychographics, firmographics, right? Demographics is kind of the data that describes people, you know, age, gender, income, you know, all, all the data. Psychographics is kind of more about the mental landscape. So kind of uh, in marketing, sometimes they refer to it as AIO, activities, interests, and opinions. What do these people do? What do they believe? What do they think? What are their hopes, fears, et cetera? And firmographics is kind of like demographics for the workplace. So what's the industry? What size of the organization? What's their role? How experienced are they? How senior, et cetera? And you might not need all of these things depending on your problem. Just to give you two quick examples, um, I worked for a customizable jewelry company many years ago. We were doing a study around engagement ring buying by um, heterosexual males. And so the demographics, we kind of knew age, a rough age range where a lot of people were getting engaged and we and income was important at that point. Um, psychographics were really important because we knew they didn't know a lot about jewelry shopping and they were really uncomfortable making some of these decisions considering their lack of knowledge. Firmographics were completely irrelevant, didn't really care what industry, where they worked, et cetera. You know, now working in pharmacy robotics, demographics, you know, if I'm looking at a director of pharmacy in a big hospital, the demographics might be less important. And they certainly, you know, at a senior level, you're at a certain age range, but it doesn't really come into play in terms of helping us make better decisions. And that's really the thing here. You want to be able to make better decisions. Psychographics um, are relevant in terms of what's important to them, what they spend time on, where their focus is. Um, how they adopt technology and firmographics, what the size of the hospital is, what, um, you know, their level of experience, that's really important. So again, different problems will lead to different emphasis here. So now with that, I can create some assumptive personas. Again, I'm making some guesses about who I think I need to serve so I can start the conversations. So that's my, I have my why I have my who, and then there's, what am I going to do? So one of the most basic things, right, we do is usability tests and we put a product in front of someone, we give them a task to do, we see how effectively they can complete that task. And that gives us a sense of where we need to make improvements. Um, for that, for a, a real-time moderated test, you're going to create a script, you're going to have a location, possibly virtual, and you want two people, a facilitator and a note taker. Um, you probably can have observers too, preferably in a different room. We'll get to that later. There's also unmoderated testing where you can just put stuff online with a script. Um, it's good for confirmation, but you don't really get to explore things. Okay, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Another technique that's relevant to today's conversation is ethnography, and that's more about discovery. Usability testing tends to be weighted more towards validation with a little bit of discovery, and ethnography is much more open-ended. So that's you know, I'm interested in this problem or this space. So you want to go spend time with people watching them do what they do now to understand what's working and what's not, how they think about things, then you can figure out how you might craft a solution that fits in with that. So those are, those are the two things that today's techniques are going to focus on. Now there are far more research activities you could do depending on the problem that you're going to learn. You might you know, put out a survey, you might do some card sorting, you could do a tree, uh, a tree test, but there, you know, and there's lots of research out there, but again, we're going to really be focusing around these real time, uh, individual interactions. Um, but again, when you're planning, I thought I'd throw this out there. This is a variation on a canvas that Jeff Patton created, uh, but if you can start with your hypothesis, your bet, what you believe to be true, what are the assumptions baked into that? And what are the questions that you, that you need to ask? Um, what, of those, what's the most important thing you need to test or learn now? That's number three. Number four, what are all the possible ways you could either test that assumption or, or fill in that learning? And then five, which, what are you going to do? And ideally, that's the thing that you can do with the least amount of work that will give you the maximum learning. You're, you're going to still want to maximize your ROI there. And then lastly, uh, number six, what did you learn from that? And this kind of there might be more than just what's going to fit in the box in terms of report, deck, et cetera. But at least you know, now you have sort of a one pager that closes the loop. So if you have people joining your team or you want to go back and ref reference activities done in the past, you have these quick summaries you can go to. So in that first part, you have to have a protocol and there's lots of stuff out there. So I'm not really going to go into a lot of the depth on this, but it's going to have four basic parts, an introduction of why you're there and what you expect and, and setting some ground rules, some context, which is usually questions to frame um, the activity and put the person in the mindset of what you want to talk about. Um, and then there's going to be some tasks you're going to give them or, or other areas of investigation. Then you're going to close it out. Again, lots of stuff online about that. So we're not going to dig in deep. 
I want to spend most of my time talking about the, the nuances that make facilitating these conversations effective. All right, so here's number one. You want to keep the environment comfortable so people don't feel like a research subject. And I kind of frame this as you want to be just on the warm side of neutral. If you're too encouraging, you run the risk of creating an environment where your participant, instead of giving you their honest uh, thoughts, will start thinking about what do I need to do to make this person happy? Right? They're giving me all this positive encouragement and this positive feedback. And now I really like this person. And I want to tell them what I think that they want to hear. And you don't want to hear what they think you want to hear. You want to hear what they actually do and what they actually believe. So a little bit warm, but not too encouraging. And you don't want to be cold either, because that can be kind of like distancing and a turn off, and then people might not be open to sharing. So just the warm side of neutral. Um, and again, don't offer encouragement either. You can give uh, complimentary feedback, like say uh, someone, someone says something, you're like, wow, I really appreciate how you articulated that. That was very clear. You know, thank you for sharing. So you can, you can participate in the conversation that way. But if you say something that's more like, oh, that's great. That's right. Something that implies there's better and worse feedback. Then again, someone might, the participant might try to figure out what you want and try and give you that so that they're, they feel like they're performing. So that is taking that neutral attitude, maybe slightly positive. Well, one other thing I'll say when you keep the environment comfortable, and this applies both in, in person and online. You can imagine I, in the, earlier, I said that you need two people. If you have a lot of people participating, especially in person, it can really make that person feel like they're being studied. So if you have one person with a half dozen people huddled around them, that can be kind of uncomfortable. So especially for in-person, only have the facilitator and the note taker in the room. And then other people can be, you can stream that content to uh, another location and people can watch from there. Even online, um, try to, you know, if there's ways to hide the participants so that uh, they aren't maybe aware of how many people are in the room watching them. They're a little easier online because once you get started, they'll sort of forget about, you know, all those other people, but you definitely want everyone on mute. You don't want anyone else chiming in. Um, that is actually a role that the, the note taker can play. If other observers have a question, you know, keep a Slack channel or some other messaging channel open to the note taker, people can message the note taker and at an appropriate time that note taker can interrupt the facilitator, you know, excuse me, I wanted to ask a follow-up question and ask the questions on behalf of the other observers. So that's how we help, you know, keep it comfortable. They don't feel like a research subject. Part of that is that neutral attitude, just slightly positive, right? All right. That's, so that's one and two. Number three, you want people to think out loud as much as possible. And that's because we want to understand what their mental model is. So anytime someone goes quiet, I'm going to ask them a question. What are you thinking? What are you looking for? What were you expecting? Something that's just going to keep them talking because the more they talk, the more I understand. Um, so anytime someone's quiet for more than a few seconds, ask them a question to get them talking. This is also typically one of those you know, I said, you know, you're going to set context in your protocol. This is one of those things we often uh, are very clear about up front that we want you to talk constantly. And if you're quiet for even a moment, we're probably going to ask you a follow-up question just to kind of understand what you're thinking. All right, next one. You want to keep it simple in terms of language, clear language, no jargon. Even if you're in an industry that has a lot of very specific verbiage that you would assume your participant knows, it's better to minimize its use just in case they're not familiar with that particular term. You don't want someone to feel stupid. That will tend to make people shut down. So even if there is a specific term, try to say it in a general way that's uh, more accessible uh, in case they don't aren't familiar with that term. Keep it open. So you want to use open-ended questions as much as possible because they expand the conversation. If I ask you a closed-ended question such as, uh, did you eat breakfast this morning? Well, that's yes or no. It doesn't really tell me a lot. I can open that up, say like, well, what did you have for breakfast? That's a little bit wider. I could say, um, tell me about your morning routine. 
right? That's, that's even broader. And I can find out whether breakfast was part of that if I care about breakfast. Now, especially when we're not practiced at this, and even when we are, it's not uncommon to end up asking a closed-ended question. That's okay. You can follow it up with an open-ended question. So in, in my simple breakfast example, hey, did you eat breakfast this morning? And someone says, no. Oh, okay. Well, what is your typical morning like? You know, then you can open it up from there. Or how does that compare to your normal daily routine? And then they'll, they can start talking about that. Um, so even you, you can always follow up a closed-ended question with an open-ended question. All right, this is one of my favorites. And this is from uh, Byron Holtzblatt, talked about this in their book, Contextual Inquiry, which is still a great foundational text for how to engage with people and really learn a lot about what they need. And that is to think like an apprentice. Usually when we think about research, we think about the sort of the scientist, you know, with their white coat and their clipboard or whatever, studying the, the lower life forms. And so like we're doing the research, we are obviously these superior beings. We are studying these other people, you know, our little organisms that we're going to, we're going to help out, right? How benevolent of us. We really want to invert that. They are the experts in what they do, right? So we're not the experts. We're trying to learn from the other, these, the people that we want to serve. So we need to think that as an apprentice, they're the ones with the information that we need to get. So we need to invert that, that hierarchy and think of ourselves, put ourselves in that lower position and put our, our, the people we're talking to in, in the higher position. Now, along with that, what someone else says is true to them. It may not be objectively true, but it's true to them. I'll give you an example. I'm going to go back again to the, uh, the jewelry company. We were, when we were doing that research study, uh, one of the issues that we were aware of was that guys don't really have a lot of experience in how to correctly identify the ring size for the person they want to buy a ring for, especially if they want it to be a surprise. So one of the questions during the study we would ask people is, you know, you know, during the process, when they get to ring size, how do you know what her ring size is? And one person's response was, oh, that's easy. It's the same as her shoe size. If you don't know, there is no correlation between ring size and shoe size. Possibly there might've been that coincidence, um, but uh, needless to say, the folks in the observation room thought that was hilarious, um, which again, that's why it was really good. The observation room was a couple conference rooms away because you really don't want them, the participant to hear a lot of laughter and sometimes they will say funny things um, and think that that might be related to them. So you know, observation room farther away, uh, good idea. Anyhow, so while on the face of it, it was like, ah, oh, this person said this kind of wacky thing. Isn't that, isn't that abusing? When you step back a bit and say, well, what does that mean? What that demonstrates is we have a really long hill to climb to make sure that people understand this particular concept and how to, how to be effective, right? Can you can imagine your, you know, you've planned out this surprise proposal You've got everything right. You've ordered the ring and you go to put it on and it's either too big and it falls off or it's too small and you can't, I mean, come on, that would kind of, yeah, it's probably not the moment people are envisioning, right? So some of these things are pretty important. And again, we want to make sure that we understand what we need to do. So um, what they say is true to them. Take it and learn from it. When you're asking questions, you want to avoid hypothetical questions. They're unreliable. Uh, observing action is the best. Watch people do what they do. That's going to be the most reliable thing. This next is have them recall something they've done in the past. Uh, they, will, they will leave things out, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Sometimes we, have a, we just have an image of ourselves that we want to project. And so our brain will filter. So we maintain that image. That's why observation is best. But recalled will give us some important parts of the story. And then lastly, we, you know, we get to imagine what you would do in this case, but if you're not in that scenario or you haven't been, it's hard to be, it's hard to get reliable data in that case. Better to say, how have you solved this problem in the past? So um, I always think of the introduction of like 3D TVs and because uh, they were really touted like, oh, this amazing technology, 3D TVs. And I can only imagine that they must've had a lot of sessions. They brought people in and they sat them down. They said, isn't this amazing? And a lot of people went, oh my God, these are amazing. And what they probably didn't say is, 
well, tell me about the last time you bought a TV. And because what they probably would have found out is, well, yeah, well, a few years later, HD TVs had just come out. So I'd upgraded my standard definition to a high definition. And well, you know, how long was that take? Well, I had that old TV for, you know, seven or eight years. All right. Well, if the last, you just got the last one three years ago, how likely are they to upgrade again? So again, you start to understand how someone has solved the problem in the past. And that's setting aside that 3D makes a lot of people dizzy. But anyway, how people have solved the problem in the past gives you a much better sense of how they might solve it in the future and how your, your solution might fit into that. Next tip is to follow the thread. You're going to have your protocol. You're going to have your questions you want to ask. And you don't want to just kind of boom, 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 go through the questions. The goal is not to get to the end. The goal is to learn. So when someone says something that doesn't quite make sense, ask more questions about that. Those can be those unknown unknowns that lead to different insights. I mean, sometimes you end up with an idiosyncratic participant who just has a different view on the world or whose context is just different from everyone else's. That's fine. You can still learn from that. But sometimes someone says something that is kind of profoundly changes how you look at the problem. And that can lead to some really interesting solutions. So this is why I like moderated testing versus the unmoderated and, you know, just putting something out there and letting people go through it again. That's why that's more validation. Uh, you only get the answers to the questions you ask. Same problem with surveys. So when someone says something interesting, you can't follow up on it. So be curious. And, and that's why we have multiple participants. So if we don't quite get to every question with every participant, because we followed some interesting threads, you'll still get the answers you need because you have enough people that you're talking to. All right, moving on. Echo, boomerang, and mumble. These are three questioning techniques that can be really helpful. Um, a conversation is kind of like playing catch, right? We, we throw the ball back and forth, and that's what keeps the conversation going. But as a research facilitator, I don't want to add content to the conversation because that has the potential to introduce bias. And that's what I want to remove, or I want to eliminate my bias. I don't want any of my bias into the conversation. So these are three ways to continue the back and forth without adding content. So echo is basically saying the same thing back to them. So someone says, so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be looking at this data to see if this thing is true. And you can say, oh, so what you'd be doing is looking at that data to see if that thing is true. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and they'll continue. So they said something and paused, which indicates it's your turn. You took your turn, but you didn't add anything to the conversation, but you took your turn in the conversation. Now it's back to them and they will continue their story. Boomerang is very similar but it's related to questions. Um, you don't really want to answer questions. You want to, because again, that's now adding meaning. So someone says, so, you know, the common, what does that button do? Oh, well, this button is going to do this thing and that thing. No, no, that's not what you want to do. That's bias. You're telling them. And now again, you've implied there's a right answer. Instead, you send the question back to them. What would you expect that to do? What would you like it to do? What would be useful to you? You boomerang the question back. You don't answer it. And, and the mumble technique, uh, sort of inspired by this uh, 70s TV detective Kojak who, who mumbled a lot. But the thing with mumbling is you, you take a, uh, advantage of this sort of social phenomena where uh, people become uncomfortable with extended silences or pauses in a conversation. So if you're not sure, especially what to ask next, you can sort of mumble your way through it. So what you're saying is um, you need, I don't even know what I'm going to ask, but you know, you just kind of slowly and maybe a little awkwardly start to form your question. And it's going to be weird and they're going to fill in those gaps. Try it. it, it it's brilliant. So echo, repeat back what they said. Don't add boomerang a question back to someone and mumble to kind of keep, keep someone else talking, especially if you're not sure what kind of follow-up question you want to ask. Don't give people instructions. Your job is to learn, not to teach. This is really hard for product people because it's, you know, product people have created the product. They know it really well and, and they want to, um, 
show someone. So if you see someone doing something that could be done better, there's this impetus to jump in and say, oh, let me show you a better way to do that. But again, now you're creating that, that uh, impression that there's a right answer. So just help them under, you know, ask questions to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And then at the end, you can say something like, hey, you know, I noticed that you are trying to accomplish this. There's another way in our product to do that. Would you be interested in me showing you? And then you can do it that you've already learned. And then you can offer, you know, some suggestions. The no answer is like, what would you expect? This kind of gets back to the, the boomerang. Don't answer their questions. Um, and kind of the last one is don't make excuses. And I find this to be most common either with startups or anytime that you're testing a prototype that is not completely built or something where there's, there's bugs. People start going, oh, I'm really sorry. We meant to get to this. We haven't done that. Again, if something doesn't work in your prototype that you're testing, it's a great opportunity to ask questions. Someone goes, I'd click on that. Well, they want to click on that and it doesn't do anything. Maybe that wasn't in the flow that you're trying to test. You will say, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't build that yet. You can say, oh, what would you expect that to do? What would you expect to happen when you click that? How would that be valuable to you? And you can ask those questions, understand what the person needs, and then you can redirect them back to uh, what you're trying to learn. Those are the main tips. The last one, it's not really a tip. Um, it's just saying we should record everything. Um, always inform people first, but even with a note taker, you sometimes just end up with notes that you go back on and you're like, I don't know what this means. So at least you have a recording that you can refer to. So I always tell people I'm going to record in 25 years. I've never had someone say no. I had one person in 25 years who asked me to delete their recording after two months, which I did. I agreed to that. By then we had already had everything we needed. I was happy to delete the recording, but no one else has ever objected. I do clarify that it is only used for internal purposes and will never be made public. All right. So those are my, uh, my tips. We got, a, we got about what, 15 minutes left, 14, 16. Mm. So we want to try this out a little bit and it's, it's going to be, we're probably going to do one round. It's going to be fast. And so you know, you're not going to get this right, but what we're going to do is we're going to break into groups. I think we'll do groups of four. Um, how many folks do we have? We've got 12, oh, we've got 12, uh, or maybe, you know, maybe two to three groups, whatever makes sense here. So we want pick one person as a facilitator. One person is going to be the participant and one person is going to be a, the note taker. Well, in this case, I say in quotes, usually the note taker would be taking notes on things the participant said, since we're not really testing something, we don't really care about what the participant's saying. What I want you to do is, is observe how the facilitator is asking questions so you can give them feedback. So you're going to be more taking notes on the facilitator. So um, if we're groups of three or four, uh, you can have multiple, multiple note takers. What I want you to do is when we're doing, getting the breakouts is just bring up, I believe it's housing.com is a, is a, I understand is a housing site in India. And so that as a participant, your job is you're searching for a place to live because everyone's done it. And so if you're the facilitator, ask them a question or two about what they're looking for, what they would want to do, and then just try and get them to do some initial searching through, um, using that site, ask some questions, try to keep in mind some of the things that, that we're talking about. We'll probably only do about five minutes. If you want to screenshot this, these are the, the list of tips. If you want to have those as a, as a reminder. Um, so I'm going to give you five minutes once we do the breakouts to have the conversation. And then we'll do a broadcast just to let you know that that time is up. And then at um, what I want for another like three minutes or so, is for the people who are playing the note taker role to give feedback on the facilitator. And then we'll bring everyone back. And if anyone has any other questions for me or on user research in general, you know, we'll, we'll take those questions. All right. Uh, any questions before we start? If you want to unmute and ask one about what I just laid out. Anyone have uh, any questions about either what I went over, user research in general? Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you so Hi. much for the session. Yeah, it is quite interesting and uh, um, it was real. <laughs> when I say real, I can't read it in a book. Actually, it's like a real, real time. So I, I had a question in my mind, like, how do we master it? Because I'm sure you have collected it over a period of experience. Like, so it's a, it's a several, uh, maybe decades of experience you have collected.
practice it and it is working for you. Now, a layman like me, when I would like to really explore this, <laughs> what are the tips uh, you recommend to start with? Sure. Um, it's actually easier than you'd think, <laughs> but it does take practice. Um, okay. But there's lots of ways you can practice at the professional level. If you're recording your sessions, you may want to listen to your sessions twice. The first time you're, you might be taking notes and going back and go, did we learn what we intended to learn from this? And that's, that's your goal from a, from a business perspective. The second time you want to go back and listen to it, you want to be thinking how to evaluate yourself as a facilitator. What did you do well? And how would you facilitate that differently? Like, oh, you know, I asked that closed-ended question there. I didn't follow it up. What open-ended question would I ask? Okay, I would ask this thing if I were to do that again. Or, hmm, you know what? They said something interesting. I didn't follow up on that. Okay, that'll start to create those triggers so that you can, you know, you'll, you'll be better prepared for future conversations. Now, the other thing that, frankly, you can also practice this is every day because the uh, not so strange truth in life is that people will think you're a much better conversationalist the less talking you do because people love talking about themselves. So if you give someone the chance to talk about themselves, they'll love it. So you can use all these techniques when you're just talking to a friend, family, and you're asking them about their day or something that they care about. Think about, well, how do I go deeper in this? How do I ask more interesting questions? How do I you know, use these techniques to get them talking about this thing that they're interested in? Because frankly, most of us, when we're having conversations, we're only half listening and we're really thinking about what am I going to say next? Mm -hmm. And so when you're thinking, when you, when you're just engaging with again, friends, family, colleagues, whatever, you can, you can put that aside and go, I don't need to contribute to this conversation. How do I, how do I learn the most about, the, about this other person that I'm engaged with? Also really helpful at conferences, you know, when you're, you get a chance to meet other participants and you want to learn about their professional experience, all kinds of opportunities to practice this. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. It's only that, that silent sometimes, <laughs> as you told me, no, the silent is uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. The so, silence one is a little bit harder in, from a social perspective, but you'll still find yeah. people will fill that gap. Um, again, mm. we love, we love talking about ourselves. So <laughs> given the yeah. opportunity, we'll do it. M most of us, um, yeah. not everyone. So Jeremy, like, uh, nowadays, like, um, as, as you have rightly note, uh, noted down also that, uh, um, most of the time uh, we assume that, yes, I know about my user. I know about my customer. And even if we start interacting also, like, as you rightly said, like, uh, we are busy in actually, uh, asking the questions and collecting the surface level information. Now to go deeper, to really understand what they're supposed to uh, tell. But you, you actually told that, like, on, like uh, uh, I want to hear what actually they want to express that about the product. So is this like only through that open-ended questionings or allowing them to uh, space and talk? Like, is that the technique? Um, let me see if I, if I understand you're, you're, you're asking is, is the only way to get that insight through the open-ended questioning? Yeah. The deeper into that customer expectation, like how do you go deeper when they do not express, when they do not tell, when, when they are not even comfortable also to uh, spend time with us. Yes. Yeah, so spending the, the spending time is, is an interesting one. There are, but there are different ways to do that. Um, in the longer version of this, I talk a little bit about recruiting participants and, you know, sometimes you're going to pay people, right? You're going to offer them an honorarium to spend time with you. Now, mm -hmm. depending on uh, how hard it is to get that type of person, you may have to pay them more. A more common <laughs> profile, you will have to pay less because there's more people out there. But if you mm -hmm. wanted, like, I'm looking for orthopedic surgeons, well, one, they're highly compensated and there's not a lot of them. So you're going to be paying more for their time. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, I think you can often get away not paying people at all by appealing to ego. Like if you, if you approach people to say, you know, look, we're building pr this product for people like you, mm -hmm. and we think that you would offer some really, uh, unique insights that would help us make this product better for you and people like you. So you're doing a couple of things there, right? One, you're telling the person you're unique and special, which is true. And they will give you some great insights that might 
it might really help. But everyone likes to think of themselves as, of course, I'm very insightful. I have great things to share and you're validating that. So yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that and share my brilliant insights. Um, but the, and the second part of that is if I use that product, I certainly want to make it better for me, right? If I give you feedback, it's more likely that it's going to be better for me. So there's a bit of self-interest there. So sometimes you can appeal to that and not have to pay people at all. Um, and in fact, I sometimes think you get even get better feedback that way. Uh, so there's just you know, again different ways you can approach people and you have to kind of make it about them. Why, why it benefits them to talk to you, not why it benefits you. Like, hi, I need to spend time with you because I need to get my job done uh, because my boss is on me and I need to produce this thing by this. Like, I don't care. That's your problem, not mine. But you know, if you can make it about why I should care, then I'm more likely to, to say yes. Mm, thank you so much. <laughs> if you, um, one thing I will, I will share, if you want to get in touch, if you have any questions, um, you can reach me at jer at msm.works. That's email on Twitter at Sonarc, S-O-N-A-R-C. And I also have a podcast uh, called Saving UX, and that's at S-U-X for Saving UX, S-U-X dot live. So if you want to reach out or find more stuff that I'm up to, those are the three ways to do it.